Welcome to the 2015-2016 Anniversary Lectures. And I want to extend a special welcome to those who are here at St. Jerome's University for the first time. And I want to send a special welcome to members of Kevin Tierney's family who are here this evening to cheer him on. <laughs> My name is Christina Benin. I'm Associate Dean here at St. Jerome's University, and I'm coordinating this year's lecture series. So before we get started, would you please make sure that you've turned down off whatever might make any kind of noises during this taping? Thank you. In his 2014 message for World Communications Day, entitled Communication at the Service of an Authentic Culture of Encounter, Pope Francis said, today we are living in a world which is growing ever smaller and where, as a result, it would seem to be easier for all of us to be neighbors. Nonetheless, Divisions, which are sometimes quite deep, continue to exist within our human family. In a world like this, good communication helps us to grow closer, to know one another better, and ultimately to grow in unity. If we are genuinely attentive in listening to others, we will learn to look at the world with different eyes and come to appreciate the richness of human experience as manifested in different cultures and traditions. Well, learning to appreciate the richness of different cultures is an ongoing challenge in, as Kevin Tierney says, these two funny places that is Canada. An Irish-Canadian film producer from Montreal, Mr. Tierney received a BA from Concordia University then took Master's of Arts courses in theater at University College Dublin. He received a Bachelor of Education degree from McGill University and a Diploma in Communications from Concordia. He then went to teach English as a second language in Chad and Algeria, and he traveled to China's Lanzhou University as a visiting professor of English. But this producer of the film Bon Cop, Bad Cop, which is the highest grossing Canadian film ever made and is a winner of Canada's 2006 Genie Award for Best Picture, was always drawn to film. As a Montreal professor, Mr. Tierney wrote freelance articles about the art and commerce of film. He has publications which include a chapter called Publicity and Promotion for the book Making It, The Business of Film and Television Production in Canada, and another chapter called The Marketing Plan and the Campaign, for the book Selling It, The Marketing of Canadian Feature Films, both books published by Doubleday Canada and the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television. Along with Bon Cop, Bad Cop, Mr. Tierney's film credits include One Dead Indian, Cerveaux de Monde, Love and Savagery, The Trotsky, Good Neighbors, and French Immersion, among others that we'll hear about. In 2007, he received the Canadian Film and Television Producers Association Award for Entrepreneur of the Year. And in 2009, the Toronto International Film Festival honored him as the Canadian Producer of the Year. In 2013, Mr. Tierney received the Quebec Community Network Victor and Sheila Goldblum Award for Distinguished Community Service. The Canadian Encyclopedia has this to say of Kevin Tierney. Fluently bilingual and irreverently witty, the founder and president of Park X Pictures is an admired figure on, Canadian on the Canadian film scene. He's a fixture on panels at industry events and key festivals, and he's an enthusiastic supporter of Canadian filmmaking. In our early communications about this le lecture, Mr. Tierney said of himself, mine is a tale of a storyteller, an Anglo, born and raised in Montreal, still in Quebec, trying to make sense of where I live and trying to get people to laugh at themselves and each other through my stories. So let's prepare to smile and laugh this evening as we learn about how film and humor can help us to appreciate these two funny places of Canada. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Tierney to speak to us on the topic Bon movie, bad movie. Mr. Chair. Very good.
Good evening. I'm not sure I recognize that guy she was talking about, but anyway, <clears throat> he sounds okay. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of, uh, of this wonderful lecture series, uh, particularly Dr. Vannon, for inviting me to come here this evening. My dearly departed mother, Bridget Mary O'Reilly, however, is I'm sure somewhere in some time and space, even more grateful, smiling from ear to ear to see her son being invited to speak at a Catholic institution. <laughs> you see, Ma, there is hope for us all. I won't go into how daunting it is to think that the previous guest who spoke here a short time ago was Professor Charles Taylor, and not to say the least an easy act to follow. In an altogether sad effort on my part to compensate, let me say the following. In the past three weeks, I've sat at dinner beside Professor Taylor's sister, the remarkable Greta Chambers, and her son, Philip, and chatted with Stephen Lewis, who managed Professor Taylor's NDP campaign in 1968. Isn't that impressive? <laughs> this is what we like to call in the business of show, name dropping. It's a pathetic attempt to gain credibility by mentioning the names of illustrious people as though they were our best friends when in effect they wouldn't know us or we wouldn't know them if we bit each other. In the interest of fair play and to avoid any comparisons with Professor Taylor and the other remarkable men and women invited to speak in this series, comparisons by which I shall surely come up wanting, I would ask you to think of me and this evening's talk as comic relief. Growing up English Catholic in Quebec in the 50s has always struck me as being the equivalent of using an American metaphor, sitting in the back of the bus. In the days, in those days, if you were English speaking, you went to Protestant schools and the French kids went to Catholic. Mix that up and you get Huguenots and in our case, forgotten. In high school, one of the four years we actually had, I never had a French, I never had a Francophone teacher in elementary school. In grade seven, my French teacher was another kid. Our, our, our actual class, uh, teacher was a unilingual man from Prince Edward Island. In, one of the, in high school, one of, the, one of the four years we actually had a francophone, um, she didn't teach us much because we were actually going at night. The French kids went to high school during the day and we went at night. And uh, after the French kids went home. People don't actually believe that this is true, but it is. People still don't believe me when I say even this is more true. That even though the mass was said in those days in Latin, at St. Rock's Church in Working Class Park Extension in Montreal, Francophones went to mass in the church, we went in the basement. We lived close to and sometimes with my maternal grandparents who came to Canada in 1929 with four children under 10. They didn't pride themselves on their Irish history, Catholic religion and culture. It was just simply who they were. Inside their house at Sunday lunch, my father would amuse himself by regularly riling my grandfather with a jibe like, all the same, that Winston Churchill's a wonderful man. <laughs> Excuse me. Though too young at the time to actually know the word apoplectic, I later came to understand the word as a palpable way of describing my grandfather's physical, emotional, and spiritual reaction to even the mention of my father's pretend hero, or anyone else for that matter, who happened to be English. My grandfather railed against all things English or Scottish. He was particularly fond of the black and tans. After lunch, however, we would go outside to play where we would have to defend ourselves because we were les maudits anglais. Now, when someone is about to whack you for being a modi anglais, it's hard to tell them how they should really try to distinguish between one's language and one's ethnicity. As a result, I've always been grateful to the Italian immigrant children who came to live in my neighborhood in the latter part of the 50s because the French kids liked beating them up more than us. <laughs> the effect of all of this was, in my case, to think of myself as an outsider, something I've always felt both in Quebec and Canada. I've never felt part of any great Anglo tradition. Toronto remains as alien to me as it did to Brendan Bean. It'll be a nice place when it's finished, he said. <laughs> Before adding, and it's far too orange. 
And I know that in Quebec, I am now as far as I will ever get towards being a Quebecois, in that I'm known as a bon anglais. A bon anglais, yeah. That means an Anglo who speaks French. To earn the title, you don't have to be very bon at all. You just need to speak French. I think of myself as a storyteller. And to be a storyteller isn't that hard, really. All you basically need is something to say and a point of view. My point of view is, I think, the product of feeling myself to be that outsider. Add, that, add to that an innate and strong sense of irony that I suspect is part of the Irish DNA. And the result is a particular way of looking at Canadian society, especially its linguistic peculiarities. With mirth, with a dose of frustration, and sometimes, admittedly, with disappointment. I've only done a few things, smart things in my life. I married a woman who was ready to share a bit of adventure. Mad woman that she is, we've been married for almost 42 years. She convinced me we should have children, and hands down, they are the greatest things we have ever produced, Jacob and Bridget. And at the age of 24, I decided I had to learn to speak French. So in 1974, where does a unilingual university graduate born in Montreal, the second largest French-speaking city in the world, go to learn French? Algeria, of course. <laughs> My wife and I found ourselves in Skikta, Algeria, in a boys' technical school as part of that noble cause known as Canadian University Services Overseas, or CUSA, which actually still exists. That was the beginning of my French immersion. One year later, after a summer in France and Belgium where we went to eat ham and drink wine and maintain our French, in that order as I recall, uh, we found ourselves in Doba, Chad, where some bureaucratic mistake resulted in there being three Peace Corps English teachers, plus the two of us, at a school that didn't need five English teachers. Showing off my, at best, eight-month-old French skills, I spoke with the director of the school en français, who proceeded to inform me that the answer to the English surface was perfectly obvious. I should teach French. After all, my French was so good. Seriously. When he revived me, I finally accepted to teach history and geography en français. And in front of all of you this evening, I would like to sincerely apologize to a small part of an extremely deficient generation of Chadians. <laughs> who will never understand electricity because I couldn't explain it to them in English, let alone in French. I just kept saying, l'eau tombe, et puis, euh, bon, on s'allume. <laughs> they look suitably blank. I mean, really, what the hell do waterfalls have to do with electricity anyway? Can anybody, does anybody know that? Back in Montreal, uh, two years later, the 1976 city seemed so much bigger, though obviously it had not changed a lick. My Montreal, on the other hand, had expanded past my traditional limits because now I had this fabulous other language in my back pocket. And so what if I had this slightly Frenchy accent and had to revert to English when I went to a garage to have my car repaired? I was, for all intents and purposes, bilingual. As it happens, children came along and we discussed their education as parents do. I wanted to send my kids to French school. My wife wanted private immersion schools. We compromised on public immersion from kindergarten on. Being the product of one of the worst public school educations ever, as I mentioned earlier, English Catholic public schools in Quebec, my desire to send my children to public schools was not to make them suffer the same way I did or offer them anything as second rate as I had experienced. It was just that as a working class boy, from Park X, private schools just didn't fit in my makeup. For the record, and in the interest of full disclosure, I am now an almost total bourgeois, complete with appropriate car and upscale Westmount address. My slightly radical daughter, here tonight to check if I'm lying, <laughs> likes to refer to me as a caviar communist. <laughs> the difference would be that my, I went to Catholic public schools in Quebec, whereas my children would go to Protestant public schools. The products of a Catholic Jewish union inevitably made them Protestant. <laughs> well, in Quebec it does. It's like how you convert. An actual scene, my son Jacob, age four, driving home from his first Montreal's St. Patrick Day parade with his cousin Kim, age six. They're in the back seat of the car eating green popsicles. It's 
20 below zero outside, and insane people wearing way too much green are handing out free green popsicles to children. <laughs> Irish people are perverse. <laughs> Jacob says, I'm Irish, are you Irish? Kim says, no, I'm Jewish. Jacob says, I'm half, drawing a line across his stomach. He still thinks that way. Like so many others, not only was I born and raised in the second largest French-speaking city in the world, I had managed to graduate from two universities without, knowing, without enough knowledge of French to get me anything but the Tarzan Prize in public speaking. When my wife and I first arrived in Algeria, we had some dinner with Algerian colleagues who spoke impeccable French. They found it very curious that we referred to each other using vous. When we explained to them that the verb endings for vous were easier to remember, you just add EZ to everything, they looked at us like we were from Mars. And we were. We were from an Anglophone Mars in the middle of Quebec. So of course I would make up, many, make up making movies, end up making movies about language and culture, or as a very complimentary but nonetheless bizarre feature article in the La Presse newspaper in Montreal said of me a couple of years ago in a big headline, Kevin Tierney, l'anglo qui met le Québec à l'écran. Kevin Tierney, the anglo who puts Quebec on screen. The interview that accompanied the, the story was conducted by a charming young woman with a decidedly French de la France accent. The tone of her interview was borderline Margaret Mead. As an Anglo, I was a kind of, I was a kind of curious specimen. Her approach was almost anthropological. In fact, I was surprised she didn't prick me with something. <laughs> Why do you think you make movies about language and culture, she asked me because it's pretty much the story of my life, Nespa. Frankly, I found the question far more curious than my answer. Born in Montreal, raised in Montreal, looking pretty much like I could die in Montreal, but still an Anglo. Some years ago, I was on a panel at the Cinémathèque Québécoise during Les Rendez-vous du Cinéma Québécois an annual celebration of Quebec film production. The topic was producing films in English in Quebec. When I was asked why I continued to produce in Quebec, I told a story about the first time I went to Russia in 1991, during the last days of Gorbachev, and we happened to meet some Russian Jews. I asked them about life there, of course, and if they were allowed to leave, and they said, yes, they could leave. Where would we go? Besides, my new friend told me, there are so few of us left, they're starting to be nice to us. <laughs> Some of the people in the audience that day did not laugh. Others couldn't believe my chutzpah, the gall of comparing the situation of Soviet Jews and Quebec Anglos. Sometimes people don't get the joke or the truth. Perhaps this is where I should mention that my, that my three siblings all left Quebec in that post-76 period. Not at ease in French, they did not feel they had a future there. I confess I love to speak French, I really do. I love learning new words and expressions. I love the Quebecois accent, I love Frenchy French, the French that Anglos, you know, that French that Anglos who don't speak French in Quebec say they can understand so well in France. At the time, I, didn't know that becoming I did not know that becoming bilingual would play such a pivotal role in the rest of my life. It is with no small sense of irony, then, that I confess that the very first project I ever produced, along with my then associate, Rock de Mers, was a five and a half hour docu documentary series about and with the person we most associate with bilingualism, the former Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. I'm going to show that, a little clip if this technology works. I feel that the Canadian people and I did dream together. We rebuilt, renewed, strengthened, and completed this country we all carry within ourselves. I look back on those days and the people I met with warm memories. And now, as long as there are fascinating new places to explore, New pathways to discover through the forests, new stars to notice in the wilderness sky, new experiences to share, and books to read. I will, God willing, remain a happy man.
Ah, uh, yes, when Canada was a simpler place. <coughs> Wait a minute, it's the same place, no? Now it's just no longer the just society, it's the just in society. <laughs> Okay, you can groan, and it's cheap, I admit it, but my only loyalty is to comedy. <laughs> that was the very first footage we shot, Thanksgiving weekend of 1990 in the Laurentian Mountains, north of Montreal. As with all outdoor film shoots, there was enormous debate about the weather. What if it rains? What are we gonna do? We should postpone, who would I call? And, and all of a sudden, I, I, everyone in the room was looking at me. Why? To make a decision, that's why, because Somebody had to say yes or no, and that is the producer. I had to remind myself that that was me. A few short years earlier, I was a, a college teacher. I had not long, that long ago, came back from being a foreign expert at Lanzhou University in Northwest China, and all of a sudden, I was a producer. I said, yes, we shoot, and the next day, we set off with an energetic former prime minister and his interesting wardrobe. <laughs> The six or seven person crew all assembled in the motel dining room for dinner near our mountain location, and the waitress and a couple of other patrons looked nervous. They knew. At some point, there was a hush as the door opened and in walked Mr. Trudeau. Everyone stared for two reasons. First of all, it was Pierre freaking Trudeau, <laughs> who most of the crew had not yet met, and then there was the fact that he was wearing a Peruvian poncho. <laughs> that very few straight males would dare to wear, even to show solidarity at a gay pride event. <laughs> the next morning, we went canoeing, which Mr. Trudeau was happy to do. In fact, he was really good at it. However, all he wanted to do was talk directly to the camera. He did not want or need questions. He had things to say. He was talking to Canada and to history, and the rest of this television business was of very little interest. In the afternoon, we had him canoe with the buckskin jacket. The camera was set up across the road, and when he put it on, the collar ended up inside the jacket, and he looked like he had just suffered a stroke. <laughs> I looked at the director standing beside me, and there he was ready to call action, like he has not noticed what Janet Jackson would later call a clothing malfunction. <laughs> Second big producer decision. Tell the director he has to ask Trudeau to fix his collar. I do. He cries, I'm not telling him that. You tell him. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> I strap on my big boy producer pants, and I walk across the road as I approach Trudeau. He looks at me with that withering look of, why is this taking so long, and when do I get to talk? And I proceed to come very, very close to him and say, excuse me, but I have to fix your collar. And I do. He says, thank you. Can we start now? And it isn't a question. When the series finally aired, a lot of jokes were made about that canoe and the buckskin jacket, an image that the director, Brian McKenna, came up with. And while I love all the jokes and parodies about it, the thing I'm most proud of is that day in the Laurentians we created, or is it fair to say we captured, an iconic Canadian image. In the world of Canadian media, that doesn't happen every day. By the way, my great producing skills costume fixing ended after our first official day of shooting a couple of weeks later when we picked Mr. Trudeau up at his house one morning to discover he was wearing an extremely unattractive, even garish, pub purple paisley shirt. Before any of us could utter a word, he said with considerable excitement, do you like the shirt? The boys got it for me for my birthday. <laughs> We should have known then and there that one of those boys, the one who is now prime minister, would likely to have fashion and hair issues. <laughs> the following day, I hired a costume person who went to Trudeau's house to look through his wardrobe and consult. <laughs> While not quite a comedy that easily fits into tonight's top, into this evening's topic, well, maybe for a few, I assume some of you are conservatives, um, the Trudeau memoirs were not quite bilingual in that we created two versions, but out, not out of desire, but of necessity, but they were, in fact, an effort at some form of biculturalism. To try and make something that would ring true for both cultures is almost utterly preposterous but what fun we had doing it. For a couple of years, we, the crew, and me traveled all over the world with Justin's papa, featuring him in conversations with artists, politicians, and world leaders from Fidel Castro to Jimmy Carter, Gorbachev and Sheikh Yamani, Christopher and Mary Pratt. 
We even shot him with Michael Ignatieff at the London School of Economics. Alas, poor Michael did not survive the cutting room floor, to use an old metaphor. There was no room for him in the version that went to air. Poor Michael, you should have known then and there the future would be unkind. <laughs> for those of you counting, I hope you noticed that I just dra name dropped big time. <laughs> like maybe in a record for a Canadian. What well, we decided with the Trudeau series was that the two versions would not mirror but rhyme, not be identical, but not go off in directions we could not get back from. Sort of what it must be like to try to govern this country, I suspect. Certainly one of my proudest moments as a producer was to see this series air simultaneously on CBC and Radio Canada in its initial version in 1994, and again on five consecutive nights on both networks on the occasion of Mr. Trudeau's death in 2000. When I look back on that time, those glorious adventures, all the extraordinary people I met, it's hard for me not to think my career went steadily downhill afterwards. That was a joke, it's good. Um, subsequent, subsequent to that series, I was fortunate enough to produce some very good television miniseries in the 90s um, and a couple of TV movies that I'm very proud of, The Henry Morgenthaler Story and One Dead Indian. And if you will permit me an aside, it is with great disappointment that I notice Canadian television is making less and less of this kind of important work that reaches considerable numbers of Canadians, but served an even more important purpose. Both the Morgenthaler and One Dead Indian projects created controversy and debate, while at the same time informed thousands of younger people of events and issues they were not aware of and probably would not have known without these dramatizations. These are not, however, the stuff that today's networks corporate owners, the phone company, is likely to put on the air, and I, for one, think more is the pity. That's the end of the public service announcement. Yeah. Then everything changed. About eight or nine years ago, I was asked to meet this amazing force of creative juices named Patrick Huard, who pitched me the funniest premise for a movie I had ever heard, and it had to be made in both French and English. A cop from Ontario and a cop from Quebec are both called to their respective sides of the border where a body literally hangs over the sign that says, welcome to Ontario, bienvenue au Québec. Neither cop, cop wants the case. Let's have a look. C'est qui qui s'est occupé du barrage? Ça m'a pris deux heures de me rendre sur ma propre scène de crime. Mais eh ouais, mais là, Dave, comment... Pour toi, aujourd'hui, c'est détective, Dave. Martin Ward. David Butchard. Enchanté. Enchanté. Hey, on est tombé sur un gars qui peut parler le français. I guess he's the victim. We can't classify him as a victim yet, but we can say he's had a bit of a rough night. Not much blood, though. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Ça m'a fait plaisir. Bonne chance, les boys. Hey, whoa, whoa, where are you going? Chez nous. This is obviously your case. What do you mean, our case? It's very clearly your case. How'd you figure that? His feet are on your side. Exactly, and his head is on your side. What's your point? My point? If you play football or tennis or whatever, you step over the line, you're out. Okay, les boys, on n'a plus rien à faire ici. On t'écris. Okay. May I remind you that in the 100-yard dash, it's the head and chest that break the tape. In horse racing, it's by a nose. As you can see, the subject was a true Quebecer. 
Secondo, do I need a passport? His heart is in Quebec. You're in Ontario, then QC. <laughs> Excuse me? I just said his ass belongs to you. Okay. We'll take it from here. Give me a ladder. Michel! Michel, go! Whoa! Don't move him. Quand tu veux je le bouge, il est encastré dans la pancarte. Never mind, let's just get this over with. What's this? Be careful not to move anything. Idiot! Don't touch! That works every time. It's always the sound of that body. <laughs> you say, no, they're going to cut it. Not gonna, it's not going to. Ah! Like, I love when the Anglo cop says, the victim is clearly a Quebecer. His heart is in Quebec. And the Quebec cop replies, oui, mais il a l'Ontario dans le cul. He's got Ontario up his ass. That, those few lines sold me on the movie, and they, later they also sold the investors. Listening to you out and tell the story, I thought to myself, how come nobody's already, how come we haven't already made this movie? Faire un film dans ce pays n'est pas un droit, mais de le faire en français ou de bien en anglais, c'est un privilège. Et ce n'est pas un privilège qu'on prend pour acquis et on ne devrait pas non plus. Tout d'abord, il ne faut pas oublier que nous vivons dans un pays où, pour la plupart, les arts sont pris sérieusement où les montants, les montants importants d'argent sont investis dans le cinéma et la télévision, même si on a l'impression qu'aujourd'hui, on vit une période un peu plus sombre vis-à-vis -vis le gouvernement et les arts. Je sais très bien qu'on puisse se plaindre. Des fois, il me semble que de se plaindre est presque une obligation nationale, un droit fondamental à tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes. Autant plus, on peut le faire dans les deux langues officielles. On devrait avoir accès à plus d'argent, plus de programmes, plus d'opportunités, plus les minorités de toutes sortes linguistiques, sexuelles, minorités visibles, les régions. Il ne faut jamais oublier les régions. Et bien sûr, ils sont tous importants, un plus que l'autre. Et j'ai le mien aussi. Comme un, un, un organisme qui représente les francophones hors Québec, j'essaie actuellement de créer une organisation à Montréal qui s'appelle « Les Anglo hors Canada ». Thank you. <laughs> they follow me all over the way. And for those of you who don't speak French, I just told the bilingual people in the audience that they had every right to feel superior and that, and that there's a good reason for the Quebec motto to be je me souviens. I'm kidding. I didn't tell them that. What I didn't fully realize at the time that when making this movie would be far more than a privilege, it would be an invitation to discover just how crazy this country really is. Bon Cop is what is known as a high concept pitch, all too rare a phenomenon in Canadian movies, yet seemingly ever prevalent in American ones. Traditionally in Canada, when we try to get a movie to finance a movie, we tend to couch things in sociology. We give it a patina of pathos and a kind of dramatic importance that is almost always guaranteed to bore the crap out of everyone. <laughs> Yet at the, at the same time, it seems so very, very important because of its absolute Canadianness. Often these films are set in winter and they involve the death of an animal <laughs> or perhaps a native shaman, all wise and woolly. Many years ago, Quebec cinema was a bit sociological as well. Needless to say, the Quebecois movies tended to have more sex, though to be fair, that sex was often of an incestuous nature that occurred in and around the family kitchen. I'm kidding again. Sort of. Oddly enough, the only thing that wasn't particularly funny about Hugh Ald's original idea was the title. He wanted to call it Bon Cop, Bad Policier, to give it a linguistic balance, but it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Our first and only rule when writing Bon Cop was politics is boring, but cultures, 
Canadian style, now that's funny, or at least they should be. Of course, I had to break the culture politics rule with my Jean Chrétien jokes. Come on, how can anyone make a bilingual comedy without making a Chrétien joke? After all, he is perhaps the on our only prime minister who could speak neither official language. <laughs> <laughs> you all agree, I know. In French immersion, I even threw in a joke about Brian Mulroney to go along with my Chrétien joke. Not just for the principle of equal time, but mostly because, as I said earlier, I am cheap. My only loyalty is to comedy. The fact is cultural jokes get bigger laughs than political ones, like this one, we unfortunately didn't have room for in Bangkok. It has to do with the fundamental question of Canada. How in the world can anyone reconcile two cultures one whose swear words are about sex, and the other's swear words are about religion. My apologies to religious people in the room. As me granny used to say, cover your ears now and you missed the juicy bits. <laughs> the two cops are driving, and the Anglo says to the Franco, how come all your swear words refer to your religion, and you don't even go to church anymore? To which the Franco replies, how come all your swear words are about sex, and you never seem to get laid? <laughs> Strangely, before Bonkop came along, nobody had actually tried to do a bilingual production. So why do it? Well, for one thing, you automatically more than double your potential audience, though given the peculiarities of the English-Canadian marketplace, that is not immediately obvious. Part of it was, I guess, to be the first to break new ground, um, to check just a reality check to see if it was actually doable. Patrick Huell recounts how it was a flash he had while appearing on the Canadian Film Awards show making English people laugh at the same time as vaguely insulting them. From there, it became a bit of a concept, as can we actually make a film that would work simultaneously across the country? And then, OK, how? Well, start with the obvious, or to be kinder, the familiar. When we first went to one of our financing institutions that will go nameless, a content analyst pedantically pointed out that our main characters were stereotypes. Bravo, I said, give that woman a gold star. She got the point. The point of using stereotypes is that they are about us. We are, who we are, about what, who we read about, see on TV or listen to in the streets, whether we live in St. John's or St. Jean, Victoria or Victoriaville. The Rick Mercer character who wears ugly shirts and loud ties and who loves to say Frenchies and Europeans and is named Tom Barry, not Don Cherry is familiar probably to even some of you in the room. Mercer's character even gets to use the F word, the one I actually wanted to use to sell the movie out west. Imagine this as a catch line. Finally, a Canadian movie that, uses to da that dares to use the F word, frog. <laughs> Pierre Lebeau's character, the chief of the Quebec Provincial Police, is every Anglo's nightmare. The person we so fear when we're driving through Quebec, the guy whose linguistic skills reminds us of that same prime minister. Listen to him, you hear him try to say, ha opportunity, opportunity. He's a scary creature. At each stage of development, we reminded ourselves to look for things that were familiar to both cultures. French Canadians have opinions about at least two things, English Canadians and hockey. French Canadians have opinions about, uh, and English Canadians have the same opinion, hockey and French Canadians. Finally, they both share at least one opinion. All Canadians believe evil Americans stole our national game. <laughs> so of course, our, our serial killer would be out to eradicate everyone who ever sold a Canadian hockey team to an American. We, wouldn't, we couldn't have our bad guy be either English or French, so to be politically correct, we made our killer a Franco-Manitoban. <laughs> sent over the edge by the sale of the Winnipeg Jets. About Trudeau-era bureaucrats going to Quebec to learn French. Have a look. I want us to be brother, Bobby boy. You in, in politics and in life, brother. Brothers, straight from the heart. You can be big, Bobby big all the way to the top you think so i know so politics is like hockey you need a good goalie the best i'll tell you what you need a quebec goalie someone who understand the quebec people 
Le sénateur Bobby Lundry, un Québec indépendant dans un Canada fort et uni, tu comprends? Euh, a free and independent Québec in a strong and united Canada. Now you understand. Oui, I think. Because le sénateur, he love Canada, c'est vrai. I love Canada. I hate English people, but I love Canada. Mais oui, and we hate you too. But that's what keeps us together. Why fix it if it ain't broken? Mon Dieu, Bobby. You're a young man, but you have the wisdom of a sage. I salute you. You and me, brothers for life. And we understand that you wash my back and I wash your back and we have clean back. Not wet back. It's the joke I tell to Madroni when we signed the deal with Le Mexique and he laughed with sa grosse voix crooner irlandais. Qu'il est, Bobby, I have something for you. Very, very special because we are... Brother. I'm gonna give you my balls, Bob. Uh, that's not gonna be necessary. From now on, you're gonna play only with my balls. Ah. It's my homage to Jean Chrétien. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a character that I've always... Uh, there's a kind of... Quebecois politician that on any given day can be uber nationalistic and uber Canadian simultaneously. Think back, Real Cahuet, Daniel Johnson. I suppose the equivalent today is the Bloc Quebecois, but they're a little more honest. But um, at least, they, at least they, believe, they believe in independence and their pensions. <laughs> I made French immersion mostly because I thought it was a funny premise. There's not really much more to it. If you want to muck around in the socio-psychology of it, it's best, it, at best, it's my way of taking the piss, as the English say, out of one of the most peculiar realities of Canada. We are a country with one great advantage over most other peoples on the planet, and that is access to a second language. One might even say effortless access to that other language, especially perhaps in Quebec. And yet, rather than celebrate that fact, exploit it for all it's worth, we have instead managed to turn it into a punishment, almost an albatross around our necks. Worse still, we have made it an endless political football that has been the political rallying cry of my entire adult life, which is why I guess I enjoy playing with it. There is, of course, a danger or two in playing in cult cultural stereotypes of any sort. I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear that we don't always see things the same way. I can't tell you how many Quebecois told me how disappointed they were that that tough guy, chain-smoking punk, Patrick Huard character in Bon Cop was such a stereotype, whereas the English cop, the, the English cop played by Colm Fior, was such a just and realistic portrait of an Anglo, <laughs> including maybe especially the turtleneck. Needless to say, we got the same reaction from English Canada. Can you stop with that uptight, constipated Anglo with the turtleneck sweater and create a character who is as real as the French cop? <laughs> When you're getting the same message from both sides, you sometimes have the feeling you're doing something right. On the other hand, consider this. When we tested French immersion before its theatrical release in a suburban mall in Toronto, much to my surprise and delight, the randomly chosen audience was made up of at least 40% non-white people. The week before, we did the same thing in, in a suburban mall in Montreal, where the audience was 100% white. The audience in Toronto loved the movie. I wanted to adopt them, I was so happy. After everyone finished filling out their response questionnaires, a focus group of about 30 people stayed behind to talk about their impressions of the movie. I sat a few rows back and listened as a young brown man in his early 20s, sitting beside his Asian girlfriend, said when asked how he thought this film would be perceived, he said, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how both Anglos and Francos think about this film. Maybe they will realize that it is no longer just about them. It's about us. Have a look at this. Je ne vous avez pas de doigts à 
when Bollywood comes to northern Quebec. <laughs> a hilarious bilingual, bicultural send-up, said the Globe and Mail, giving the film three out of four stars, and it died. Having lived through the headiness of great success and the great sadness of failure, there's one thing I can tell you, absolutely sure, success is way better. <laughs> failure sucks. Not that long ago, I was watching TV in bed, flicking around the channels as men are purportedly genetically wired to do, and I hit on French immersion on TV. Alone, waiting for my wife to join me, I started re-watching the movie and found myself laughing like an idiot. When I heard my wife coming, I switched to another channel as though I'd been watching something illicit. <laughs> laughing at your own failed movie while lying, lying alone in bed is illicit, no, or maybe just pathetic, I don't know. <laughs> Success or failure aside, I remain convinced that we can tell stories to Canadians in both official languages. We just have to make those stories ones they both want to see and hear. Because even if we don't necessarily always like each other, we have no problem laughing at each other. And when we, the storytellers, get it right, we can even get Francoids and Angloids to laugh at themselves. And that can only be a good thing, I think. In between these movies, I've had the great pleasure to make a film on location in County Clare, Ireland, and St. John's, Newfoundland, called Love and Savagery, directed by John Smith, the uh, passionate story between a young Irish nun and a poet from Newfoundland. I think I, my Catholic schoolboy fantasies were, for the most part, fulfilled. <laughs> but the greatest pleasure I've had has been producing two films written and directed by my son, Jacob, The Trotsky and Good Neighbors. And there's a clip of that. Hello, police. Oui, uh, uh, je m'excuse, mais j'ai oublié comment on dit uh, hostage negotiation en français. Ah, d'accord. Merci beaucoup. Uh, yes, I actually just got off the phone with the cops uh, just a second. Uh, uh, they're on their way down now. I told them that I, I wasn't armed, technically, but that I could still do lots of damage. Stop talking to the cops. I thought it was cool. Don't say anything else till I get there. No cops yet. I guess people don't actually care what happens to you. What exactly do you hope to accomplish today, Mr. Bronstein? Because the almost certain outcome of this is you going to prison. Yeah, I think that was pretty obvious by now. Why hand. are you deliberately sabotaging your own life? Hey, 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 listen to me. I... I am not sabotaging my own life. How dare you? And if I was, it would be for the sake of my ideals. Oh, please, your ideals? You want to better the existence of your fellow man, is that it? Yes, yes, that's exactly it. Well, let me tell you a few things I learned after teaching public school for a few years. They don't want your help. They don't want it better. They want the same old shit. If they didn't, this wouldn't be so hard for you. No, you want to know what's hard for me? What's hard for people like me is the very existence of people like you. You make me sad, Mr. Bronstein. A revolutionary sans a revolution. You're a real Russian tragedy. Oh, you are. You, you are that doctor in Uncle Vanya. Ineffectual and middle-aged. My troops will mobilize, just you wait. They will shed the thick cloak of boredom that you have forced them into. They will don their coat of arms, and the, the, the tunic of oppression that you wear will choke you, sir. You couldn't have mixed that metaphor anymore. I make my point. A couple of fine actors there. <clears throat> um, for all I know, it may be the result of eating green popsicles at a young and vulnerable age or just some other form of aberrant genetic cross-cultural restructuring, but the artist that Jacob Tierney, my son, has become is equaled only by the maturity and graciousness with which he conducts himself professionally and personally. Making films like the Trotsky and Bone Cop in illustrates, however, one of the quint quintessential issues for Canadian producers, which is trying to make capital C Canadian movies and trying to sell them. The first Americans who read the Trotsky said, does it have to be so Canadian? What's E-talk? Who's Ben Mulroney? And my answer was yes, it has to be so Canadian. That's the point. Because of its similar nature, call it a genre uber-Canadian, we could not sell Bon Cop either. 
Ironically, however, the film went on to sell for half a million dollars around the world because they liked, not because they liked my Jean Chrétien joke, but because the action comedy genre is a strong seller on the international scene. Someone reminded me recently that I'd been quoted somewhere as saying, I want to make films about people who win, not people who lose. I want audiences to feel good when they walk out of my films. I'm not sure what the context of that quote is, but the slightly glib oversimplification notwithstanding, it is true that as I age, I have a lower and lower threshold for despair. I don't like watching those kinds of movies, and I certainly don't want to make them. The feeling good part, however, should not be confused with the simple, the stupid, or the superficial. Feeling good can also mean having experienced some sort of catharsis. Good is being entertained, provoked, moved to tears or laughter, aroused, stimulated, and when I go to the movies, I go in search of entertainment in that sense of the word. The opposite is leaving a film feeling dehumanized, so often through excessive violence, depressed, uninspired, unenlightened, unamused, unentertained. As a culture, I think we tend to make too many personal films that leave the audience feeling despair, if they feel anything at all. Usually these films do not have sufficient, sufficient artistry to convey a notion of catharsis, so they just end up being depressing. Just because something is personal and has happened to us doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make a great film or even a good one. As for the winning part, the fact is that my life, like all of yours, most of ours, is made up of a series of victories and defeats, small and large. Why so many filmmakers are prone towards showing us losing and not winning remains a mystery. It is not, however, only a Canadian mystery, should that be of any consolation to any of us. We are all in search of an audience. And in the movie business, the audience is the true measure of success. Canadians are not adverse to success, perhaps just inexperienced at dealing with it, maybe even slightly immature. But believe me, everyone wants us to succeed, if only for financial reasons. And we, the filmmakers, storytellers, entertainers, whatever we are called, we need to recognize that fact and need to respond to it with the same kind of enthusiasm. I don't want to oversimplify what that means, but I do think it's important for creators to remember the audience. To reach that audience, I don't believe we have to pander or be reductive, but as in any good relationship, we need to be à l'écoute, as they say in French. We need to be thinking about their needs and wants and desires as consumers of entertainment. I know that's sometimes thought of as a horrible sounding phrase in artistic circles, but let's face facts. If we want people to spend 12 to $15 each to see our movies, Forget the popcorn, the tub-sized sodas, the babysitter, the parking, and all the other stuff that ends up making it a very expensive evening. We better be prepared, prepared to offer them some fun. Fun. I don't mean laughing, just laughs. We can make them cry. We can scare the shit out of them and make them, make, keep them awake thinking about the moral dilemmas that we rather, we'd rather not necessarily have to consider in our own personal lives, but we have to make it fun. We must engage them. We must entertain. I think of our role as entertainers as a noble one. The capacity to laugh at life and to be able to make people laugh is, to me, a great gift in any language. I know maybe 45 words of Chinese. And I constantly embarrass my family by trotting out my 45 words every chance I get. By the way, I, do, I would do the same thing with my 32 words of Algerian Arabic, but there's just less opportunity. When I speak Putonghua, or Mandarin as you old colonials call it, Chinese people smile and they smile in that nice way, a way that seems to say thank you, thank you for being open to us, thank you for acknowledging that we are equally open to you exactly the way most of us smile when non-English speakers make an effort to communicate with us. It's really pretty basic stuff, smiling and making people smile. These are not bad things, and if you can make a living at it, tant mieux. Cheche, merci beaucoup, thank you. Do I go, do I stay? Take some questions. So we have a microphone, one on each side. If you want to comments or questions, I'll let you hand it. Okay. I know it's always always the kids at the back of the class. That, oh, oh no, no. Oh, you're coming. Just 
立つって<笑> I'd,、uh, I'd start by saying thank you.、Uh, You're very good. I had a Quebecois roommate a while ago, a long time ago now, and、uh, that movie really、uh, prompted a friendship that lasts to this day. We were united by our. We realized through watching it that we had a shared fondness for bickering and disliking each other because of our <laughs> backgrounds and we have so much in common. It's, yeah. But、uh, I also I wanted to ask because I heard that earlier this year there was,、uh, a sequel was funded and、uh, whether you could share anything about that? <laughs> How much time do you have now?、Um, <laughs> yeah, there is.、I'm, I am no longer involved,、uh, um, but there is a sequel. Uh, that will probably begin shooting in the spring. Cool. Well,、uh, about I'm dis- time. Disappointed to hear that. That was something I've been waiting for for a while, but also. Oh, thank you. Thank you and、uh, Jacob for those two great, many great movies. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi. Hi.、Uh, th- thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. I wanted to hear you speak a little bit more about the English speaking community in Quebec or the Anglo Quebecers, as one myself and who identify with that community.、Um, and you, who've been in Quebec probably much longer than I have. No.、Um, <laughs> a little no, bit, Quebec- right? <laughs> now I'd、I'm, say we're now contemporaries. Well.、Um, but just kind of like, do you, do you. I haven't been well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> do you.、Um, Do you, do you see,、uh, do you, in your experience, do you see English speakers in Quebec identifying as a community now, as actually Anglo Quebecers? Do you see a future for that group, but not? And what kind of role they can play in kind of bridging the two cultures,、uh, similar to kind of Franco Ontarians or French speakers outside of Quebec、yeah. who tend to also bridge those cultures? That's, I, I, that's a very good question. I, I think there has been a, excuse me, a resurgence in. In the Anglophone community. I think for a long time, people were just, just really didn't, didn't really want to talk too much about it.、Um, but I think of, of late,、um, uh, for example, I think you know, the Trotsky, which, which you know, it was a movie made in English but had a lot of crossover, was really hailed in the media、um, as a kind of breakthrough、uh, movie in Quebec that was the new Anglophones. You know, Anglophones who weren't afraid of, of,、uh, of, of、um, living a full life in a city. The, But, you know, the, the fact. Anglos, you sorry? The bon Anglos. The bon Anglos. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and they, and, they, and they wanted to make it, to turn it into a movie about this is, you see, this is the positive side of Bill 101. These are all the, the children of, of Law 101, except Jacob had the right to go to English school without Bill 101 because I went to English school. But,、um, But it only lasted a very short period of time. Because,、uh, you know, it's, I mean, if, if, if you take, for example, the, the, what I said earlier about being a bon anglais, if, if I cannot assume a full, or feel like I can assume a full role as a, as a, in Quebec as a Quebecois, and remember that the, when Rene Levesque was asked, what is the definition of a Quebecois, he said, quelqu'un qui reste.、Ouais. Well, Je pas mal、um, and, but if, but if I, what is it like if you're a 20 year old African francophone? First language is French, but you don't, where are you in that culture?、Right? How, and that's the real next big test for Quebec is that you wanted everybody to learn French. Well, they did. Now, where are they in television? There was just a story in La Presse this,、uh, this, this uh, last weekend about a shocking, I mean, done by the Quebec Drama Federation in, in French, talking about absolutely no minority presence in Quebec theater. I mean, Jacob, who became this big, sort of celebrated new young Anglo in Quebec, was asked just like that one day, What do you think of Quebec cinema? And he said, Well, it's, it's, it's Pas mal blanc. And it was like a headline, and he became targeted by everybody, every newspaper. It was a big argument, and it was, but it is. So, you, you know, this homogenized culture for, faces a lot of challenges. And again, I don't know if English, if English is the major one. I don't, I don't, I think like that young man said in Toronto, now it's about us. You're welcome. I'm finding it hard to, to put into words, but、uh, 
first of all, I'd like to, to congratulate you. In this age, with the audience so fragmented and tied to their iPhones and not getting out in public much, as much as we would like them to, tonight being a splendid example, uh, on being able to survive uh, <laughs> and, and thrive even uh, in the present society. But what sort of a future do you see for um, a common culture that people meet together to share? I'm, um, I'm not ter you know, I think we really missed the boat along. I actually think that the, if you, my own sense of Canadian culture is the, 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 the enlightened attitude that created CBC and Radio Canada is two, you know, separate but equal, right, um, entities that have nothing to do with each other, nothing really was kind of a roadmap for separation, if you think about it, right? One of the things that I, that I took out, but one of the things that I, I, I wanted to get into in reviewing the Trudeau series is that, you know, the, the joy of doing one of those political memoirs is you go into the archives, right? And so you go into the archives and you look back at the material and you say, for example, let me give you an example, perfect example, because on Sunday, uh, November 15th, it'll be the 40th anniversary of the election of René Lévesque, okay? So just imagine how that was covered by Radio-Canada and CBC. I mean, Bernard de Rome, who was the Knowlton Nash of Quebec, was beaming, and Knowlton Nash that night was delivering the news like he was sitting Shiva. It was like, oi, it's over, Canada. And Bernard de Rome said, oh my God. It was like ridiculous. And I mean, he looked as happy as Peter Mansbridge now does with Justin. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like already nervous. He's like, he's got this creepy little grin on his. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I think that's, you know, there's a huge, and nobody ever made an effort, right? I mean, nobody's made it, you know, you think, that's why I said before about the, when we put up the Trudeau series was one of the only shows to ever be broadcast in both languages simultaneously on the same network. And as I said, they didn't, they weren't the same show, they, they mirrored. So we haven't done ourselves a favor in that regard. Um, every federal institution, the National Film Board, which is, you know, pretty much not a, a major, uh, a major uh, undertaking today, but again, completely separate in French and English. So once you do that, right, you, you separate everything, of course they're gonna thrive you know, independently of each other. So as one common culture, when we started, when I started producing, we would say Canadian, you know, uh, we'd say uh, English Canadian films and, you know, mm. now we just say Canadian films and Quebecois films. So implicitly in the language, we've all acquiesced. We've, we'd say it, it's great, it's over, done. And maybe that's the best thing, so it may be. Because it's a bit of a, you know, I mean, for all of the, the, the investment we made in bilingualism and biculturalism, it's, it's um, I'm not so sure it's really paid off. Well, I'm essentially unilingual. <laughs> <laughs> no, I but I, yeah, no, but as I said, well, to me, that's, you know, it's, it's too bad because we did, we did, we all have the, uh, you know, we did, we do have the opportunity. It's not like we were discouraged. So, mm -hmm. you know, public policy, but we also tried to discourage people from smoking and doing all kinds of other stupid things, and that hasn't worked either. So. Thank you. Thank you. I guess it's my turn, but this is way long. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is uh, very interesting that you're coming this uh, weekend as uh, there, there's uh, uh, this uh, Quebec movie called uh, My Internship in Canada that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, being featured at the Princess Cinema for yeah. four days. That's uh, a lot. I saw it. Well, I didn't see it, but I'm okay. here tonight instead of being there. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, featured here for four days. And so what do you think of, of, uh, of the uh, current level of, of export uh, uh, 
um, of Canadian films uh, in, in, in the rest of Canada and also in the US and the, all the world. Uh, do you have anything to share about this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I have to tell you this, it's no, it's no better the other way, right? The, the likelihood of you seeing an English Canadian film in Montreal is pretty small. But we have to stop thinking about, that's an old paradigm. We see a theater is, is no longer our definition of success. I mean, most, it just costs too much money to put a film into a theater. I mean, it's it just too expensive. Whereas, you could just put it up on your TV screen, which is probably even a, as the same projection system as you'd have in that theater, because I guarantee you it's on a little, you know, little key. Um, so, you know, look, look at the movies. If you go to a multiplex, you're going to see movies that are $100 million movies, you know, franchise operations. You see, you know, Hunger Games 1, 2, 3, 9, 12. I mean, you go, there's 14 screens, but the same movie's playing on 10. You know, and then you come along with your little, you know, your little Canadian movie. And it's just, it didn't happen 30 years ago when, or 20 years ago even, when there was an independent, you know, an independent cinema chain and people were actually interested in small movies. We have to really look at new alternative forms of distribution because the old days, we're not, we can't compete in that. And most, even American independent cinema, for, which still hardly exists now, um, you know, most of those go on pay-per-view. That's the way the money, that, there's no more real DVD rental. So most of the money that used to be generated from VHS and then DVD is now generated from pay-per-view. So, you, you know, for five bucks you buy, get it in your house. And you don't have to get a babysitter. I know that's one of your issues. <laughs> Anyone else? Good. Thank you all very much. It was uh, nice to see you. So right now I'd like to invite forward Dr. Carrie Lapin-Fortin. She's associate professor in the Department of French and Italian Studies here at St. Jerome's to formally thank our speaker. This one? This one? This one. This will be short and sweet, but in les deux langues officielles. <laughs> Alors, uh, uh, four years ago, il y a quatre ans, j'ai écrit à Park X Pictures à Montréal pour savoir si M. Tierney viendrait nous parler de, du cinéma, de son travail ici uh, lors de l'anniversaire des 150 ans de St. Jerome's. Et j'étais, and I was delighted, when just a few days la later, I had uh, a very personal email that made me laugh, the way yours did to Christina, saying, bonjour, si je suis toujours vivant, je viendrai avec plaisir. Huh? <laughs> If I'm still alive, I would love to come. <laughs> And I am delighted tonight to see that he is very much alive and well, and hope that he will continue doing his work. But I think he was a bit, a bit surprised that I was reaching out to him all this way from Ontario about movies done in Quebec. Why was this happening? One of the reasons is that I do these monthly soirées ciné for my students. And I wanted an opportunity to thank him for entertaining scores of my students over the last, what, since 2006 when the movie came out. I've shown the movie three times now. And I also lend the DVD. Is that, that's not illegal, right? And, uh, and yes, it's stereotypes, but it gives them an opportunity to think about those stereotypes. Et c'est un film bilingue. Et ça fait, on a attendu longtemps pour avoir ce genre de, de, de film au Canada. Donc merci, merci pour ça. Um, I also wanted him to come so we could laugh. We always need a good laugh, do we not? So that was a big part, but it was, there was perhaps a little bit more to it. Um, we're more or less from the same generation, and uh, my parents are Irish also, but from the North. And so when I decided I wanted to study French in Toronto, and I was studying English in double major, I had for a candlelit class to read Two Solitudes, Hugh McClendon. And I remember it affecting me, but not really understanding until I went to study in Quebec a couple of years later. And then for some reason, this désir de rapprochement, 
in my own modest way, teaching French and trying to open people's minds about l'autre. So for me, it's also a way of thanking you for, in your own way, your delightful way, of, uh, of trying to bridge that gap, that gap, that bridge, um, so that perhaps there will be a day when we can actually have mutual understanding, mutual respect, mutual appreciation that won't just be limited to some little circle of people here that can actually comprendre dans les deux langues, mais que tout le monde pourrait comprendre hein, et apprécier l'autre. Donc pour ça, euh, je vous remercie, Monsieur Kearney. Je vous remercie d'être venu ce soir. And I think we all uh, appreciated your talk very much. Merci. Bonne continuation. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Carrie. So just a few more announcements and things to say before we finish up this evening. First of all, to remind you to sign up in the foyer if you want to receive the latest information about these anniversary lectures, as well as other lectures and events that are taking place at St. Jerome's this year. We do send out regular email reminders about uh, upcoming speakers. And so we want to make sure that you receive those reminders. So please feel free to sign up. Every year, St. Jerome's University is pleased to present a program of speakers to our community and to present them free of charge. And we're able to do that at no charge because of the generosity of so many partners and supporters. If you too would like to support the lectures, there are some donation envelopes in the foyer and I think some here in the chairs in Siegfried. And always a big thank you to all who give so generously to support us. If you missed it on the way in, then on the way out, feel free to stop at our table and buy some wonderful fairly traded prod uh, products that are available for, for sale by the Social Justice Committee. And our local independent bookseller, Wordsworth Books, is also in the foyer with, uh, this year and has some books about this year's speakers and the topics that we're covering. I want to let you know that the next Bridges Lecture that connects the humanities and mathematics is going to take place on Friday, November 27th. Professor of English from SUNY Oswego, Fiona Cole, and Professor of Math from the University of Buffalo, E. Bruce Pittman, are going to address the topic, Thinking Matters. There's more information about this lecture on the bulletin board in the foyer. Thinking Machines. Thinking machines. I'm sorry, Benoit. Pardonnez-moi. And if you have further questions on that lecture, Benoit, who, who organizes it, was here, then you can ask him for more details. The next anniversary lecture is going to take place on Friday, December the 4th. Barbara Coloroso, founder of Kids Are Worth It Incorporated, will be here to speak on the topic, Breaking the Cycle of Violence and Creating Deeply Caring Communities. Ms. Coloroso is an internationally recognized speaker and consultant on all kinds of topics like parenting, bullying, a positive school environment, grieving, nonviolent conflict resolution and restorative justice. She's the author of a number of books, including Just Because It's Not Wrong Doesn't Make It Right, Helping Kids to Think and Act Ethically, and Extraordinary Evil, A Brief History of Genocide and Why It Matters. Hope you'll be able to join us. And finally, I want to thank you as well for coming this evening. I hope that we will see you at December's lecture and throughout the rest of the year. But for now, have a safe trip home this evening. And until next time, good night.